What we're going to be looking at today is circular motion. Let's imagine that we have the following experiment. So we have a we have a mass m which we have connected via a string of radius r, and we're rotating this mass at constant speed. So all the way around this circle over here, the speed is constant. It's really important to know that even if the speed is constant, the velocity will be changing. So this is really, really important. The velocity will be changing. The reason for the change in velocity is that the direction of this vector v will always be changing. For example, if I was to draw the same vector, let's say at this point, at this point the, uh, the mass will be going purely vertically like so let's say that this is our vector v let's assume that this is with the same size as the one above and you can see the direction has changed quite significantly even though the size of the vector is the same now this is where it gets really really interesting even though the speed is constant there has to be an acceleration present. The reason for that is because the velocity has changed. And remember, acceleration is the rate of change of velocity. So uh, there has to be an acceleration which changes the direction of this vector from pointing along here to along there, and then again and again throughout the continuous motion of this object. In fact, the acceleration of, uh, of this mass will be always pointing towards the center. So we can represent that with a separate vector. We can call that A, for example, which will be pointing towards the center. This is what actually centripetal means. It means center seeking, I believe, in, uh, in Latin. So the acceleration um, will be pointing towards the center. Let's just write that down. So velocity will be changing. So if that's true, there has to be an acceleration. So we can write that. There has to be an acceleration. And in fact, the value of this acceleration, the magnitude of it is given by the equation that the centripetal acceleration is equal to V squared over R. If you're curious how this formula is derived, please have a look at my uh, challenge video which uh, guides you through the derivation of this formula. We can take this a step further and saying that if there is acceleration, well, there has to be a force acting as well because the uh, net force acting on an object is proportional to the acceleration if the mass is constant. In other words, F is equal to ma. So uh, if the acceleration is v squared over r, the net force will be mv squared over r. And this is the formula for the centripetal force. So F is equal to mv squared over r. This force is always acting towards the center as well. So the acceleration is acting towards the center. Uh, the, 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 the force is acting in the same direction. And that means that let's say that if my mass was here, the centripetal force will be acting towards the, the center. Not quite, let's try it again be acting towards the center. That's a little bit more accurate. So this will be the force. If the object was, let's say, here, the centripetal force will once again be acting towards the center. And the value of it will be exactly the same. So this over here is the force F as well. There's yet another really interesting question that, that we can ask, which is why does the speed of the mass not actually change when there is a net force acting on it? To answer that, let's look a little bit deeper into the diagram which we have drawn. Now notice that the net force F is acting towards the center and V is the tangential velocity. Now that means that this angle here, so we'll just draw that in red because it's really, really important. That this angle here between the velocity vector and the force vector is actually 
90 degrees. In other words, the force is perpendicular to the direction of motion. Now, this means that there is no work done. There is no work done because work done is equal to um, force multiplied by the uh, by the displacement and uh, there's the cosine of the angle between them now uh, if this angle is 90 degrees cosine of 90 is equal to zero so there's no work done so in this case this will be equal to F times the displacement in that direction uh, times the cosine of 90 degrees which is equal to zero degrees but once again just to summarize the force and the direction of motion are perpendicular which means that there is no work done one final point we need to make is when we look at those two main equations the one for centripetal force and the one for uh, centri uh, for centripetal acceleration is that we can use some of our knowledge of angular velocity to express those equations in terms of angular velocity the way we'll do that is if we simply use the fact that the uh, linear velocity is equal to r omega uh, if you're curious where this equation comes from, just have a browse through one of my previous videos and you're going to find a video on angular velocity. So just to finish this little derivation, we just need to expand the brackets. So this is going to give us m r squared omega squared divided by r. And if we just do a little bit of cancellation, so if we cancel this R term, we're going to get that the net force is equal to m r omega squared. Or additionally, just without the mass, the centripetal acceleration could also be given by the radius multiplied by the angular velocity squared. Okay, folks, now let's have a look at a past paper question from January 2010. So we have figure 2.1, which shows the London eye. It has 32 capsules equally spaced around the edge. Okay, so we've got the radius, which is 60 meters. The rear rotates about a horizontal axis such that each capsule has a constant speed of 0.26 meters per second. So if you are taking a ride on the uh, London Eye, well, that you'll be traveling at approximately 0.26 meters per second. Calculate the time taken for the wheel to make one complete rotation. Okay, well, we know that um, speed in general is um, equal to distance of time. Now, the total distance that you would cover in one rotation will be the circumference of that circle. So, V will be distance over time, the circumference will be 2 pi r, and the time, let's call it the time period, T. What I will do then is just simply rearrange for the time period, which will be just 2 pi r divided by v, and then I'm going to plug in some numbers. So this will be equal to 2 pi multiplied by the radius, which is 60 meters, and then I am going to divide that by the speed, which is 0.26, and if we plug that into a scientific calculator, we're going to get 1,000. 450 seconds okay next one each capsule has a mass of 9.7 times the power of 3 kg calculate the centripetal force which must act on it okay well the formula for centripetal force is mv squared over r so f is mv squared over r we pretty much have everything that um, th that we need to directly input into into this equation so the mass is 9.7 times 10 to the power of 3. We're not going to forget to square the V. Uh, this is actually one of the most typical exam errors just to forget a square in a relatively simple calculation. So 9.7 times 10 to the 3 multiplied by 0 0.26 squared. Really, really important. And we're going to divide that by the radius which is 60 meters. And if we input those values into a scientific calculator, we're going to get 10.9 newtons. One mark is going to go for this substitution and another one.
for the final answer. Okay, folks. So I hope you've you've have enjoyed this uh, this lesson about circular motion. If there are any questions, feel free to drop a comment down below, and please consider subscribing.